Welcome to episode 343 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Gavin Rothery. Gavin was roommates with Duncan Jones when he did Moon, and Gavin ended up doing a lot of the concept art for that film. He talks a little bit about that and that experience, but he's moved along in his career and recently wrote and directed a cool sci-fi film called Archive. So we'll dig into that film as well, so stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also published a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 343. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional log line and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer, director Gavin Rothery. Here is the interview. Welcome, Gavin, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Hello, thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Well, I grew up in Yorkshire in North England in the 80s. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was kind of, I wasn't around any entertainment. It wasn't like I was an LA kid or anything like that, by quite a long shot. There was mm -hmm. nothing around me. So I grew up in Britain reading comics, reading 2000 AD, Judge Dredd, Road Trooper, Strontium Dog. And then I went to school and all I really wanted to do was be an artist. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. <clears throat> so I basically focused on my art, got myself into uni, blah, 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 followed the trajectory towards being a, a, um, a comic artist. Then... In like '96, when I graduated, um, the, the comic industry kind of rolled over and died because Sony launched PlayStation, and everything. The games industry just got really hot. So fortunately, the skills I've been working on to be a comic artist translated into work in a game studio. So that huh. kicked me off down a trajectory of working in games. I worked on uh, GTA 3 on the Xbox SKU. Uh, did all sorts of stuff. The time was. Um, and then I ended up meeting a chap called Duncan Jones at a games company um, called Elixir Studios, which is gone now. Um, and we ended up becoming mates. He was at film school, he wanted to do film stuff. I was just doing all of his VFX and stuff. We ended up like um, moving in together and flat sharing. And I was just like this sort of, you know, obsessive artist working at home all the time, just, you know, just trying to do cool stuff, basically. He was making his student films. I was doing all of his visual stuff. And we just ended up becoming uh, just becoming mates and just working on everything together. So we ended up living together for 10 years, um, uh, trying to make a film. We had a couple of false starts, but eventually we made Moon. Um, and that, that whole project just came from us sort of kicking around our flat, really feeling like we were never going to get anywhere and being quite, quite feeling like quite desperate about our careers and just being like, what can we do? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we get this done? And we came up with Moon. So we just, Moon was born from us talking about what, what our limitations were and how restricted we were with things. And um, yeah, we got Moon made. So that was all cool. Um, so working on Moon, I did so much work on Moon. Like I was, you know, designed it all, did all the graphic design, motion graphics. I even did stunts and stuff in the film. I was just around everything, um, just mm -hmm. making sure it got done right. Like myself and Duncan, I was like the kind of art side of his brain, really, if you kind of think of it like that. Mm -hmm. So having gone through moon and been right there right in the in the in the middle of it all <clears throat> excuse me that gave me the confidence to have a go at doing it myself so i thought yeah when we finished moon um duncan moved out to la and he was trying to get me to go out with him but i had just met a girl that i really liked so i stayed in london and fortunately now um we have a, a little girl of our own together um who's actually in our oh, congratulations <laughs> strangely mm -hmm. enough so um everything comes full circle so yeah, that put me down um, <clears throat> put me down a road to um, doing it myself. So it's all just about 
sort of self empowerment really. It was just about me getting an idea together, figuring out how to get it made. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that um, and and dig into sort of archive. Um, how did you make that transition? As you were going through, like an example, if you're going through Moon, you're working on other projects. Did you start to just let people know, hey, I'm also want to be a director? Um, did you, what were those steps to actually going from you know visual artist and and making that next step to being the the director and the writer on this project? Well, I'm quite shy about my art in a sense because I learned quite early on that the people that tend to talk about their work are the people that aren't really doing that much work. So I prefer to talk about work once I've finished it. So I only really mm -hmm. talk about work in progress when I kind of have to. Like, occasionally you have to try and do something to live a profile of something. But like right now, like, you know, on Twitter, I'm just talking about archive constantly because I'm, I'm trying to kind of lift it as much as I can because we're like a, a week away mm -hmm. from the release at the moment. And um, I think one of the things, too, that I would definitely want to mention about this is you're going to have to have two jobs. I mean, that's what I've done. I mean, even now, I have two jobs. Like, Archive's about to be released, and I have another job that I'm working mm -hmm. right now. So I am a film director and a film writer, but right now that's not paying my bills. What's paying my bills now is mm -hmm. doing concept art for Cell Citizen in the games industry. You know, I've been working with those guys oh, for the last, like, six years, and they're a wonderful team, and everyone gets on great, and it's brilliant. But you know, I need to have another job. So I basically have to spend all my time working to get this stuff done. Um, but mm -hmm. that's cool, you know, so I signed up for that. But um, yes, I need another job. What you do need, you got to, okay, my big advice to aspiring writers is, is it's all about using your time. It's about how you use your time, right, where, and where you deploy your kind of mental resource. So first of all, before you write, now, one of the things that I always get, I always kind of find it quite funny when I'll, I'll see people like on Twitter and they'll be talking about their scripts and they're like, I did five pages of my script today. How awesome is that? And I used to feel really bad about that because archive was the first thing I'd ever written. And I used to see that and just think, wow, you've written five pages today. So if, you, if that's a hundred page script, that means you're gonna, it's going to take you 20 days to write a script and that's it. That's all it took you when you've got a film in your hand in potentia. And it doesn't work like that at all. Like, you know, I can write five pages a day, fine, but if I haven't worked out my story and I don't know what my story is, it's going to be five pages of garbage, probably. Um, so I spend a lot of time working out my stories before I get into the script. So when you're actually writing pages of your script, what I do is I've got a, a story document, um, like a story roadmap, which has usually got a lot of detail in it. My story, uh, story roadmap might be like 30 or 40 pages of what translates to a 100-page script. There's loads of detail, mm -hmm. and I don't ever give myself any rules. I won't say, like, it's basically just my story document is me dumping my thoughts and then ordering them. <clears throat> so I'll go through multiple versions of it. And whenever I'm working, I go through a process of um, <clears throat> excuse me, filtering the document. So I'll start off just having loads of notes and ideas, and then they'll eventually, um, you know, I'll just end up with a really long document of notes. And then the next, the next one will be, I'll open a thing up next to it, and I'll copy and paste and I'll put them in some kind of an order that feels like a story. And there'll always be some square things and they don't quite know where they fit yet. They always go on the bottom. And then I'll go to bed and I'll sit in bed at night and I'll read through it. And I'll have my, my iPad and my phone. I'll read it on my iPad. And whenever I have a thought about what needs to be better, I'll make a note in my phone. And I'll read through it all and then I'll go to sleep. I'll be in a pitch black room and my girlfriend is asleep beside me. I'll just be reading. Um, and then wake, when I wake up in the morning, I've got a list of notes of things that will make my story better. And so at any point, mm -hmm. I can sit down at my computer and that those notes in my phone are telling me what I need to do. So it's a very easy way to trick yourself into starting to work because I don't really need to think about it because I've already done the thinking. So all I've got to do is sit down, mm -hmm. open up my Word document, my story, look at my notes on my phone, and it will say, okay, halfway down the first page, um, you know, you, that, that character shouldn't do that now. They should do it in 10 minutes in that other scene because it had more power. Mm -hmm. In this scene, it should be doing something else, a bit more relaxing to lead you into it, things like that. And, it, and it's, it's all these notes and conceptual stuff. So then I'll, I'll, I'll put all that stuff in there and I'll save the document off again. I always use Dropbox. I'll save it in Dropbox. And then when I go to bed that night, I'll do the same thing. I'll read through it again. I'll have my phone open. And this time, I'll have a better version of my story and I'll have different thoughts on it, and those notes will go in my phone. And I'll just repeat that cycle. Really nice way of working, I've found.
because having the notes in your phone before you go to sleep, it makes you feel good and sleep sounder because you, you're working in the middle of the night and everyone else is asleep and you, your story's coming on. But mm-hmm. also, more importantly, uh-huh. means that when you need to get into the business of actually pressing some keys the next day, it's very easy to be productive because you've literally written down a thing to tell you what to do. And so you can open up a document, mm-hmm. cold, and just get into it. And once you start typing, you'll stay typing as long as you not getting distracted by anything you know if you can clear away you know make sure you don't have to break off in 10 minutes for some random stuff that's happening give yourself a bit of time and just put all your notes in and at the very least address all your notes they all tell you what to do so you've already done the thinking literally follow that list and do all of the things on that list save your document out and read it again in bed in the darkness you just keep doing that and that's my cycle i just keep doing that and that's where all my stories come mm-hmm. from Yeah, and that's an excellent tactical tip just for someone, especially if someone has another job, you know, and they're working a nine to five. It's a great way to just continue to push your project forward. Yeah, it keeps out forward movement. Um, And the whole thing that that I had, because it was the first thing I'd ever written, I had a whole thing about writing at the beginning. And I was like, oh, I'm I'm not doing it right. I need to I need to hire a little cottage up a mountain. I need to go up there for three weeks and not talk to anybody and turn my phone off and write. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to my producer, Phil, about this. And I was saying um, in a meeting we were having, I was saying, like, I feel like a total fraud because I'm just jumping in and doing 20 minutes of writing and then having to do a load of other stuff and then coming back in at the end of the day and doing an hour and a half and then reading my thing in bed and making some notes. And I was saying, I feel like a real fraud because I think I'm not doing it properly, like a proper writer. And he just mm-hmm. laughed and he said, like, this, that is being yeah. a proper writer. <laughs> And it really stuck with me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, as long as you get in forward motion, it just doesn't matter. Keep moving. Yeah, yeah. So let's dig into your let's dig into your latest film archive. Maybe to start, you can just give us a quick pitch or logline. What is this film all about? It's about a chap called George Almo, set in 2038, 20 years in the future. Um, He is a roboticist, a robotic scientist working on a human equivalent AI, and he loses his wife in a car crash. And he basically dedicates his, um, he's on a research program to create an artificial intelligence, human equivalence. And so he basically secretly skews his work towards trying to recreate his wife. I gotcha. So I'm curious, and this is a kind of a trivial question, but I'm always curious. How did you decide on the year 2038? It always seems to date movies. I mean, the famous book 1984, obviously, we're well past that. And, and you know, I think Fahrenheit 51, I think I read that that actually takes place in the year 2020. So how do you how did you decide on 2038? And what's what's, you know, to not feel dated? Because obviously, in, you know, 15 years, 20, we're going to be very close to 2038. And this film is going to feel kind of dated if, if we're not close to this. Well, I don't know. It's 2020 now, and judging by the events going on in the world, I think this might be the last year. <laughs> so we might, we might not make it. So, so I there think you I'm go. fine. I, I think I'm good. No, I, seriously, though, yeah. um, I actually, I, you're right about that stuff. And I, I tried to not have any dates in the film for that very reason. But at the same time, I felt it did need that whole one foot in reality, one foot in the future vibe to it. And mm-hmm. so I thought it needed a little bit of that. And given that we had limited production, I was taking a few liberties with things. Like well, I used a lot of spray sports car in the film, which is actually a, you know, a 70s, 80s car. Um, so I was doing that whole thing about mixing it up a little bit. And I just, I didn't, I don't know. It just, the day it just kind of fell in there and then it felt right. And my rationale about it dating mm-hmm. in the future is I'll worry about that later. I'm making a small independent sci-fi film now. If it turns out that people love this film in 20 years, I'll just consider myself very, very fortunate and leave it at that. Do you know what I mean? It's like I can take that one on the chin. You know? Yeah. So where did this idea come from? What was the genesis of this idea? It came from a really, really bad weekend I had where I had two computers. My computers, I should say, failed over at the same time on a weekend. I was in the middle of a huge flat clean, so I was feeling miserable. My house was a mess. Both my computers went down, and it was. Some, I don't. I still don't know what happened to it, but I lost data on hard drives and all sorts of stuff. It was a horrible, horrible mm. affair. When you work freelance and your computers die, it's a bad day. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was trying to just get on with it. It was in the weekend. I couldn't do anything about it straight away, so I had to sit with this problem all weekend and finish tidying up my flat because it was just a mess. Just in a real fog and sulking, and I was just my brain was in a dark place, and I was I was 
I was trying to get ideas together for a film and I was just thinking about all kinds of stuff generally. And I just somebody create in an artificial intelligence that was meant to be human equivalent. And when they turned it on, as soon as it became sentient, it just killed itself. And I thought that was like a really weird, creepy idea that kind of took hold in my mind. It was a bit dark, but there's something about it that I found quite compelling. So then I tried to expand that into a story by thinking about how might the person that created this AI, how might they then go about trying to convince the AI to live? You know, like, what would that be? Um, and mm -hmm. as far as getting a story together, I personally, I mean, this all comes from me being a fan. So whenever I'm making something, I always try and make something that I'd like to watch. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I always like in films is stakes in the films that I can get behind. So sci-fi can be really bad for this because quite often the stakes are, you know, we've got to we've got to do this thing or the world's going to end or humanity will be destroyed. And it's all really big. It's all these big scale things that don't really register beyond the scale of a roller coaster popcorn ride. You know, it's all it's nothing that's mm. nothing personal. So. I wanted to write around the themes of love and death because those are the two like universal constants that we all have experience with in some form or another. So taking this core of an idea and then sort of pushing it down the road around the themes of love and death, it very quickly manifested itself into what became archive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just what what separates the, uh, an independent sci-fi movie like this from, you know, a 90-minute episode of Black Mirror? Um, and I say that with reverence because I think Black Mirror is excellent. Um, but what do you see as the differences between, you know, an independent writer-director like yourself doing a film like this and an episode of Black Mirror? Well, I mean, I've not worked with the Black Mirror team, to be honest, so I don't know how they work. But I think one of the things that you do get with something like this is you get that kind of auteur experience where our production team mm -hmm. at Independent were just superb. They really trusted me and just kind of let me go with it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I might never get to do that again in the rest of my career. I might never get to make another film. I mean, who knows? But this was me, yeah. like, doing whatever I wanted within the restricted budget that we had. But the film was designed around a restricted budget, so that was fine. Like, it was always going to be restricted, so I was writing around that. And I was picking the battles with the production to make sure that we didn't overspend or get into a hole. Like, you know, the money was, was always very carefully deployed in what we were going to do with it. And we weren't going to overstretch or get ourselves into a place we weren't going to be able to get out of. So I guess the one thing that would make this different would be that. It would be just me doing my thing. I mean, you know, I, was, I wrote it, I directed it, I designed, um, did loads of the concept work. I was uh, doing production design. I did all the graphic design, motion graphics, like all sorts of stuff. Like I was, you know, mm -hmm. I was very involved. It's, it's, proper, it's a proper baby project, you know, it's like my baby. There aren't that yeah. many jobs on a film set that I can't do. And so I get in everybody's department. How can people see Archive? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? Well, we've got a U.S. release on the 10th of July. It's going to be on demand because the theatres still aren't open. So mm. there's a bit of a bummer yeah, that because sure. it was supposed to be a, 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 a wide theatrical release in the States. And, you know, as a filmmaker, that's what you want. And then we get this whole pandemic thing and it's all streaming. But you know what? I got a film finished. I can't complain about anything. Everyone's got big TVs yeah. in the house. Everyone's got big speakers, comfortable sofas, fridges full of snacks. You know, watch it in your pajamas, have mm. a nice time. <laughs> uh, I can't complain yeah. about any of that. So it'll be, it'll be on yeah, demand, sure. but I'm just hoping that I'm just hoping that people can sort of enjoy the cinematic vibe I was trying to bring to it. Yeah. Well, yeah. How can people keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing? I'll round up for the show notes. Yeah, you can get me on at Gavrov on Twitter, at G-A-V-R-O-V. -V. So get me on there. I kind of live on the internet whilst I'm working, so I'm on there all the time. So, um, okay. yeah, Tw uh, Twitter is the only real source of media that I do. Okay. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Well, Gavin, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me today. Good luck with this film, and good luck with all your f future films as well. Yeah, thanks, Ash. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, nice one. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk to you guys later. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high-quality professional evaluation on your screenplay.
When you buy our three-pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly Best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer-director Eric Bress. He wrote a number of big-budget horror films, including Final Destination 2 and The Butterfly Effect, and now he's moved on in his career and his writing and directing. We talk a bit about his backstory, how he broke into the business, and then we talk about his new World War II horror film called Ghost of War. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.